Uh, Dr Gupta, thank you very much and thank you to IDSA uh, for the invitation to come to this conference and my congratulations to IDSA and to my old friend Utam Sinha for such a wonderful conference program. It's a delight to be here. Um, my, uh, my presentation, I, be, I guess, begins with the idea of the Indo-Pacific and, and basically I think... Uh, sorry. Uh, the Indo-Pacific to me is a strategic realm. It's a strategic realm that is somewhat inevitable because, as you can see by this map, it's actually a very old trading corridor. It's actually older than the Silk Road that most people talk about, which is a terrestrial Silk Road that went across uh, the heart of Eurasia. Actually, the Maritime Silk Road uh, started before the terrestrial sil Silk Road and lasted longer than it. The three circles you can see up there are actually monsoonal uh, cycles uh, that dominated the Indo-Pacific trade before the arrival of Vasco da Gama in the Indian Ocean in 1492. So, to my mind, uh, the re-emergence of the Indo-Pacific is somewhat of an in inevitability. It uh, actually re-establishes a very old trading highway uh, that was disrupted by the arrival of European co uh, colonial power in the Indian Ocean uh, in, from 1492. Of course, uh, the next division of the Indo-Pacific came about as a result of the British Empire. Uh, the British uh, really tied up the Indian Ocean by uh, establishing control over all of its choke points as well as its major ports and made really uh, the Indian Ocean into a British lake up until uh, the end of the, the British Empire after the Second World War. Of course, the Pacific uh, was not as peaceful as this British lake. The Pacific, uh, from, the, from the launch of the Opium Wars uh, all the way through to the end of the Vietnam War, was a much more tumultuous ocean. It, there was a lot more strategic competition uh, in, uh, in the Pacific Ocean. Then, of course, the Cold War divided the Indo-Pacific between competing blocs. And finally, the idea of an Asia-Pacific, a Pacific Rim uh, that linked North America uh, with Northeast and Southeast Asia was yet another conceptualization that divided the Indo-Pacific. But what I'd like to argue to you today is that there are several changes that have occurred uh, over the past 20 years and that are accelerating that have re-established the Indo-Pacific as a strategic realm, a strategic realm that is defined by two contradictory processes. The first is economic interdependence that several of my distinguished colleagues have talked about and the second contradictory te uh, trend is uh, the rising strategic rivalry, which again my distinguished colleagues have been talking about. How do we start to establish some empirical data around the rise of the Indo-Pacific? Well, one way to look at it is trade figures. From the 1990s onwards, we were told uh, that the next century would be the Asia-Pacific century. And there was a lot of triumphalism about the rise of this Asia-Pacific trading cycle across the world's greatest ocean. As these figures show, however, the pan-Asian trade was always larger than Asia-Pacific trade, and pan-Asian trade has been growing and growing extremely fast uh, ever since. Pan-Asian trade, in fact, is accelerating away from cross-Pacific trade. Now, what is uh, some of the main reason for that. Obviously, uh, the rise and rapid growth of what I call the world's only two continental economies. By continental economies, I mean India and China each have more people in them uh, than any of the world's continents except for the, world, for the one that they occupy. This rapid economic growth has, uh, has spurred a number of results with major economic and strategic effects that I'd like to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about. Before I go on to these, however, I'd like to 
uh, make the argument uh, that, as I put it, economic growth, particularly rapid, even explosive economic growth, particularly in large countries, is not secular. And by that, it, by that I mean that you cannot have such rapid economic growth, such rapid rise in power and prestige for a country of the size of China or of India or even of Indonesia without it changing that country's self-perception of where it sits in the world, what it expects from the world and what it should be able to do in the world. So I think one of the things that is often missed in the analysis of Asia's strategic dynamics is what is actually happening to the self-perceptions of Asia's rising giants. But back to the main story. One of the main consequences, of course, uh, of uh, the rise of pan-Asian trade, the rise of Asia's two continental economies, of course, is the rise of Asia's energy uh, dependence. Uh, basically, uh, the year 1993 is a very important year because in that year China, the country with the, Asia, uh, the Pacific Asia's largest uh, oil supplies became a net energy importer. And as this, char this chart shows, uh, China has become increasingly dependent on energy imports ever since. Korea, Japan, Taiwan were always dependent on energy imports. India has always been dependent on energy imports. And Southeast Asia has become increasingly dependent on energy imports. Let me give you a few uh, very quick statistics. The International Energy Agency forecasts that developing Asia will account for 63% of the growth in global energy demand between now and 2035. Of this, China will comprise 31%, India will comprise 18%, and Southeast Asia will comprise 11%. India and China will go from together comprising one quarter of global energy consumption today to one third of global energy consumption in 2040. And of course, so much of this consumption and an increasing proportion will come from energy imports. The International Energy Agency uh, uh, forecasts that China will be uh, dependent on imports for three quarters of its energy uh, oil consumption by the year 20, uh, 2035. By the same year, India will depend 70% uh, on imports for its oil consumption Japan, Korea, Taiwan, almost 100%. The other side of this equation, ladies and gentlemen, is that there is only one region in the world with the reserves able to service this level of energy demand growth. The Gulf region will supply, again according to the International Energy Agency, three quarters of China's energy by 2035. 83% uh, now of Japan's, moving up to 92% by 2035. Currently 64% of India's energy imports, moving up towards 84% by 2035. 85% of Korea's, and you can see the picture. On the other side of this equation, so you can say that the Gulf represents significant supply security for developing Asia. On the other side of this equation, uh, Asia uh, represents significant demand security for, for uh, the Gulf region and particularly for the largest supplier, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia exports three times more oil to the five largest Asian customers than it does to North America and Europe combined. Almost half of all of Saudi Arabia's oil goes to Asia's big four consumers, Japan, China, India and Korea. So you can see the strategic relationship that comes out of this energy interdependence. Uh, you can see how important 
these oil flows are not only to the consumers of energy uh, but to uh, the suppliers of energy. But there are other forms of interdependence that are developing as well. Economists call this trend global production sharing. The fact that most uh, elaborate manufacturers from cars to electronics are now made up of component parts that are assembled in various parts and various different countries depending on where it's cheapest to do so. And the fact is, ladies and gentlemen, that Asia is the most advanced region in the world for global production sharing. East Asia uh, represents two thirds of the developing world's component exports. Just 11 East Asian economies produced, produced 39 per cent of all global uh, component parts. So you can see that these are linkages that are starting to draw the region together. And the fact is, ladies and gentlemen, that basically uh, this is drawing the Indo-Pacific into a common uh, strategic realm. Overlaying this process of strategic interdependence is, I believe, a process of deepening strategic rivalry. It is driven, I think, by China's rise, its extraordinarily rapid rise, its challenge to US predominance, and the worries and the uncertainties that, uh, that sets off in the countries around China. My point here is, and let me be very clear about this, I'm not arguing that China has any designs for regional hegemony or regional leadership. My point is that in international relations and strategic affairs, it just matters that other countries worry that it may be able to mount a bid. That is the key difference. And I think you can see a range of different strategic responses. One is a tightening of alliance and partnerships with the United States. Another is the growth of strategic partnerships between countries such as India and Japan, India and South Korea, Japan and Vietnam. Uh, these are real differences. These are accelerating changes and what I call the steepening of Asia's power topography. The other trend we're seeing, ladies and gentlemen, is what I call the normalization of Asian security. The era in which most Asian countries spent the majority of their security spending on internal security has now ended. Uh, CIPRI, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, documents a 200% rise in Southeast Asia's weapons spending in the five-year period to 2012 compared with the previous five-year period. Of that, maritime weapons systems comprise 52% with another 37% on weapons of possible maritime use. There has been, I believe, a growing shift towards maritime weapons system and maritime strategies. What I'd like to suggest in my conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, is that this is going to be a new age of maritime economic interdependence and maritime strategic competition. The argument I'd like to leave you with, ladies and gentlemen, is that the debate so far has tended to focus on choke points and ports. Who controls the, Mal the Malacca Straits, the Straits of Hormuz? Who is building and financing Guada and Hambantota and various other ports? I'd like to present an alternative point of view. I'd like to suggest that strategic competition in the Indo-Pacific for the next decades will take place around three bays and three peninsulas. The three peninsulas are, as I call them, the, the South Asian Peninsula, the Indo-Pacific Peninsula and the West Pacific Peninsula. The three bays are the Arabian Sea, the Bay of Bengal and the South China Sea. The interesting thing about Asia's, uh, or at least uh, maritime Asia's strategic geography is that so much hangs on these bays and peninsulas. Let's start with the peninsulas. The two outside peninsulas, the West, the West Pacific Peninsula and the South Asian Peninsula, 
in very similar ways, I think, constrain Asia's two rising giants. Uh, uh, strategic dilemmas in each of these peninsulas are seen to hold down Indian power and Chinese power, prevent them from projecting their power in a maritime way in an effective way. Peninsulas, by their nature, constrain, funnel, concentrate and bundle power. And therefore, the ability to transcend for these two uh, rising giants, these constraining peninsulas, is very key. The one in the middle, of course, is the Indo-Pacific Peninsula, a, a, a chain of islands and peninsulas uh, that actually divide the Pacific from the Indian Ocean. The country that is able to control the Indo-Pacific Peninsula will be able to project power into both the Pacific and Indian Oceans. The bays, of course, are key to the peninsulas. They're enclosed bodies of water. You can imagine dominating a bay in a way that you can't dominate an ocean. They provide strategic options to the territories around them. And already each of these three bays in maritime Asia are subject to contestation, territorial contests and disputes and jealousies among the various great powers. So that's my vision, ladies and gentlemen. I believe, where does India fit in this? I believe India, unfortunately for Governor Narayanan, I think India is an inevitable great power. That as competition rises among other great powers for the bays and peninsulas, so India will take part in this, in this competition. And my final word would be that in this new age of strategic competition, it is the choices of smaller countries that will become crucial. Whether they decide to side with one power or another, be it in the West Pacific Peninsula, the Indo-Pacific Peninsula or the South Asian Peninsula will be key and will be crucial to the way the balance of power in the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, goes into the future. Thank you.